let me ask you to look at these two images because we're about to talk about the worldview question. I think this is a provocative way to begin to think about that because what you see are two images that look somewhat uh, similar to each other, but they stand in uh, for somewhat different worldview perspectives. This being, of course, a beautiful stained glass window, the rose window in Westminster Cathedral. And this is an unusual view of DNA, not looking at it from the side, but looking down the long axis of DNA so you see that radial pattern. And the question that many people pose, and which I pose to you tonight, is, okay, those are two worldviews, the scientific and the spiritual. Do you have to choose? Do you have to basically throw in your lot with one or the other and neglect the other one? Or is there a possibility here of being someone who could merge these two, not necessarily building a firewall between them, but actually having both of those perspectives uh, within your own experience? I think many people today are arguing that these worldviews are at war and that there is no way to reconcile them. That has not been my experience, and that's what I particularly would like to share this evening, and then I hope we will have some time for questions uh, from those of you who would like to pursue that in one way or another. So I think I owe you at this point a little bit more of a description about my spiritual perspective. I described my scientific uh, pathway. How is it that I stand up here before you this evening in a distinguished university and talk about being a believer in God? Many of you might have assumed that the only scientists who were uh, those who learned faith in childhood uh, would have it later on, but that's not my story. I was raised in a family uh, that was wonderfully unconventional. Uh, my father had been a folk song collector in the 1930s in North Carolina. Uh, after the war, he and my mother did the 60s thing, except it was still the 40s. And <laughs> I don't think it involved drugs, but they did buy a dirt farm and tried to live off the land. <laughs> and uh, that didn't go very well. Um, I discovered that that was not a credible way to have enough income to serve a growing family. I was born on that farm. By that time, my father had gone back to teaching at the local college, and my mother had started writing plays. And they founded a theater uh, in the Grove of Oak Trees up above our farmhouse, which I'm happy to say is about to have its 54th consecutive summer season. So I got raised in this wonderful mix of ideas, of music, of theater, the arts. My mother taught me at home until the sixth grade, which was also very unconventional in the 1950s. And she taught me to love the experience of learning new things. But the one thing I didn't learn much about was faith. My parents didn't really denigrate religion, but they didn't find it very relevant. And so when I got to college, I had those conversations that one has, even though I might have had some spiritual glimmers along the way, they quickly disappeared in those dormitory conversations where there's always an atheist who's determined to put forward that argument about why your faith is actually flawed, and mine wasn't even there at all, so it was pretty easy uh, for the resident atheist uh, to dismiss my leanings of any sort. I was probably an agnostic at that point, although I didn't know the word. And then I went off to graduate school and studied physical chemistry and very much was involved in a theoretical approach to trying to understand the behavior of atoms and molecules. And my faith really then rested upon second order differential equations, <laughs> which are pretty cool, by the way. But uh, just the same, I became increasingly of a reductionist mode uh, and a materialist mode, and I had even less tolerance then for hearing information of a spiritual sort and considered that to be irrelevant. Some, uh, some cast, uh, sh appropriately should be cast off information left over from an earlier time. But then I had a change of heart as far as what I wanted to do professionally. I, I loved what I was doing in chemistry, but I discovered that biology, which I had pretty much neglected, actually had a lot going for it. Recombinant DNA was being invented. There was some chance here that we might actually begin to understand how life works at a fundamental level. And realizing that that was a real calling for me, and also that I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a researcher or a practitioner, I went to medical school. 
Uh, that had not been part of my life plan, and it's still rather amazing. The medical school left me, let me in with that story, but they did. I arrived in medical school as an atheist, but it didn't last. Because in that third year of medical school, I found myself, as one does, taking care of patients. Wonderful people with terrible illnesses. Illnesses that medicine was not going to be able to solve in many instances. People who saw the approach of death, knowing what was coming, and to my surprise, seemed to be at peace about it because of their faith. That was puzzling. And as I tried to imagine myself in that situation, I knew I would not be at peace. I would be terrified. And that was a bit disturbing, but I tried to put it out of my mind until one afternoon when a wonderful elderly woman who was my patient who had very advanced heart disease that we had run out of options for and who knew her life was coming to a close told me in a very simple, sincere way about her faith and how that gave her courage and hope and peace about what was coming. And as she finished that description, she looked at me sort of quizzically as I sat there silently, feeling a little embarrassed, and she said, Doctor, I've told you about my faith, and we've talked about my family, and I thought maybe you might say something. <laughs> oh. And then she asked me the most simple question. Doctor, what do you believe? Nobody had ever asked me that question before, not like that, not in such a simple, sincere way. And I realized I didn't know the answer. I felt uneasy. I could feel my face flushing. I wanted to get out of there. The ice was cracking under my feet. Everything was all of a sudden now muddled by this simple question. Doctor, what do you believe? So that troubled me, and I thought about it a little bit and realized what the problem was. I was a scientist, or at least I thought I was, and scientists are supposed to make decisions after they look at the data, after they look at the evidence. I had made a decision that there was no God, and I'd never really thought about looking at the evidence. That didn't seem like a good thing. It was the decision that I wanted the answer to be, but I had to admit I didn't really know whether I had chosen the answer on the basis of reason or whether because it was a convenient form of uh, perhaps willful blindness uh, to the evidence. I wasn't sure there was any evidence, but I figured I'd better go find out because I didn't want to be in that spot again. So what did I do? Well, you know, I figured there are those world religions. What do they believe? I'd better find out. And I tried to read through some of those sacred texts, and I got totally confused and frustrated. And there was no Wikipedia to help me either. <laughs> it's much easier now. <laughs> There's even a book on the shelf called World Religions for Dummies, but they didn't have that then either. So at a loss, I knocked on the door of a minister who lived down the road from me in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and said, I don't know what these people are talking about, but I figure it's time for me to learn. So, okay, you must be a believer. At least I hope you are. You're a minister. <laughs> Let me ask you some questions. So I asked him a bunch of probably blasphemous questions, and he was gracious about that. And after a while said, you know, you're on a journey here trying to figure out what's true. You're not the first one. And in fact, I've got a book here written by somebody who went on that same journey from an academic perspective. In fact, it was a pretty distinguished Oxford scholar. He found around him there were people who were believers, and he was puzzled about that. And he set about to try to figure out why people believe and figured that he could shoot them down, and, well, why don't you read the book and see what happened? So he pulled this little book off the shelf, and I took it home and began to read. And in the first two or three pages, I realized that my arguments against faith were really those of a schoolboy. They had no real substance. And the thoughtful reflections of this Oxford scholar, whose name, of course, is C.S. Lewis, uh, made me realize there was a great depth of thinking and reason that could be applied to the question of God. And that was a surprise. I had imagined faith and reason were at opposite poles. And here was this deep intellectual 
who was convincing me quickly, page by page, that actually reason and faith go hand in hand, though faith has the added uh, component of revelation. Well, I had to learn more about that. Over the course of the next year, kicking and screaming most of the way, because I did not want this to turn out the way that it seemed to be turning out, I began to realize that the evidence uh, for the existence of God, while not proof, was actually pretty interesting. And it certainly made me realize that atheism would no longer be for me an acceptable choice, that it was the least rational of the options. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.